Hi everybody, Radical Gardener. Monday, December 14th. Does it feel like something's gonna go down? Boy, it sure does to me. All right, so let's see, personal update. That third eye cleanse, highly recommend it to all of you. Or for who's, who's ever interested. So what I'm gonna do is I'm go you ha I always have my contact information. Now remember, it takes me a few hours to get my contact information onto the bottom of the video. The videos are taking a really long time to load. There's something going on with YouTube. It's been going on for a week. So it took like eight hours for my short little video to load up. So I'm just giving you an FYI. But on this third eye cleansing, I gifted it to 12 people that are in my circle. That's their Christmas present. <clears throat> and she's able to do four a day. And she did the first four yesterday. And every single person um, had uh, definitely felt the same thing that I did. Um, I don't know if you can tell. And I've mentioned this before, but my eyes keep getting bluer. I don't know if you can see. They're really hazel and they're getting bluer. Um, so I don't know what that means. Uh, I'm just letting you know that there are some changes and uh, I, you know, it's like the way it feels physically is that the front of my head feels exposed. It feels open and then it's a good thing. That's a really good thing. It feels exposed and taking in, receiving, giving out, whatever the energy that is needed right now. Um, and, and let's just say there are no words for any of this. Like we're, I'm just putting words to it, but the fact that I'm trying to put words to it, I think diminishes what's actually happening. Um, and um, uh, there's a, a calmness inside um, a sense of purpose is revealing itself. What's the next step? Maybe not what's the next step, but there's a, a picture forming, you know. Highly recommend it. We need it right now. We need people with clarity. We need people to turn inward to focus on self uh, as that is where the real power will come from to facilitate change. I mean, we can all be on social media and we can all be talking about the politics, but I don't know how much good that's going to do. We've created the buzz. The buzz is there. The support is there. But, um, you know, where do we create the real change? And it's in the mind's eye. It is in uh, what is possible, all things possible, living in the end, live, living in Christ consciousness, living in love, living in light, but seeing it, knowing it's who and what we are. It's not a concept. It's not something you go learn in church. It's not something you read in the Bible. It's right here. It's right in us. It's in every cell. It's a connection that is easy to make. You just make it, right? There is no secret here. That's the big lie. That's it, it doesn't take a, a tremendous amount of work. You don't have to sit in meditation. You don't have to, uh, you know, go to church every day. You don't have to get on your knees all the time. All you have to do is just profess that you are Christ consciousness. You are the, 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 the uh, as special as Christ is. You, you can do the things that Christ did. We can manifest what Christ did. The, the, he was the supreme teacher, you know? And so this is something that it is time for us to embrace who and what we are. This is what we can bring to the table. Whoever takes over office, whatever, if it will be, uh, you know, um, Biden and his crew, well, when would you need the light? You'd need it a whole lot more than <laughs> So, I mean, it is about facilitating change in a way that is acknowledged by one's true self. That's my spiel. Okay. I think, please don't tell me I put the wrong ones in. No, I did not. I think that this is the year 2012. I'm just saying. Okay, I'll tell you why. So I listen to old Art Bell shows, and there's just gold in those shows. And I was listening to one, and it's a scholar, Peter something, and he has read 
thousands and studied thousands and thousands of texts text thousands yes text i'm thinking of like phone text of manuscripts that's a better word um of manuscripts uh that deal with how christ spent his life i mean who and what was he you know um uh you know where did he go you know, I mean, I mean, he was here in the Americas working with the Native Americans. I, that's nowhere in the Bible. Uh, he was, um, uh, and this is all documented. That's what's so crazy about it. He was in India for for ages. He he's, he's, he was um, uh, when he was in India. He was studying the manuscripts of uh, Osiris. Uh, and um, and uh, which later became the teachings of Thoth. I mean, you know, and, and then it then it later kind of got warped when it into the the later into the Egyptian culture. You know, there's uh, uh, and I think the Osiris text came from what was called the you know um, they call them what did they call them the rev the the it's Scripture from Mu. I just ordered the book, which is Lemuria. And so it's these same teachings that have been around longer than 45,000 years, right? All saying the same thing that Christ said. Okay. And there's evidence that Christ studied these works. Well, you start diving into this stuff, it's fascinating. And you start, you're getting closer to the truth. So, this gentleman who has been studying all these manuscripts, he said in passing, he said, and this was an interview in 1998, and he said, well, you know, this isn't, he said, our calendar is off by seven years. Let's see, so, yeah, seven years, eight, I think he said eight years. I've been reading so much, I'm really trying to remember this right. So that puts this year at 2012, that we came into this year as 2012, not 2020, 2012. So I just read a little bit about Dian Dionysus, and Dianysus, Diancius. Diancius is, uh, well, I'll tell you who he is, but he is responsible for changing our calendar. And of course, had everything to do by, uh, um, instructions per the Roman Catholic Church. And they were trying to hide some atrocities and really fix a date for Easter. And the whole thing was just like made up, okay? So, um, and there, there is an astronomer, mathematician out of Russia, really, like genius, genius. And I have his book, I, I mean, that's gonna take six months to read. But he proved through astronomy and these like, these charts, timeline charts, that were like, you know, a thousand feet long of how our history has been changed. And he said, and it was to hide atrocities. I'm just saying. Let's read a little bit about Dianceus. Okay, so Dianceus, uh, 470 to 554, 6th century monk, born in Scythia Minor, which uh, is Romania slash Bulgaria. He was a member of a community of Scythian monks concentrated in Thomas, present-day Constanta, Constanta, the major city of Scythia Minor. Dianceus is best known as the inventor of Anno Domini, dating, which is used to number the years of both the Gregorian calendar and the Christian Julian calendar. Almost all churches adopted his 
calendar for the dates of Easter. So it was all pretty much made up. So from about 500, uh, he lived in Rome, where as a learned member of the Roman Curia, he translated from Greek into Latin. Moving down, uh, he had great authority in the West and continued to guide the church administrations. He also wrote a treatise on elementary mathematics. So he was no small potatoes. I mean, this guy had a lot of pull, uh, you know, in the church and at, at that the political and in politics, uh, which was there was really no line between the two. According to his friend and fellow student, Cassiodor Cassiodorus. Doris, Diancius, although by birth a Scythian, was in character a true Roman, most learned in both tongues, by which he meant Greek and Latin. He was also a thorough Catholic Christian and an accomplished scripturist. Okay, moving on. Just giving you kind of a outline of who he was. He translated standard works from Greek into Latin, Principally, the history of the discovery of the head of St. John the Baptist. And St. John the Baptist, that, now there's another one. Boy, there's some real interesting text on John the Baptist who lived for a very long time. So there's a lot of the stuff that is so interesting. Um, okay, so Diancius is best known as the inventor of Anno Domini dating, which is used to number the years of both the Gregorian calendar and the Julian calendar. He used it to identify the several Easter's in his Easter table, but did not use it to date any historical event. When he devised his table, Julian calendar years were identified by naming the cons consuls who held office that year. He himself stated that the present year was the consulship of Probus Jr., which he also stated was 525 years since the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. How he arrived at that number is unknown, but there's evidence of the system he applied. He invented a new system of numbering years to replace the Diocletian years that had been used in an old Easter table because he did not wish to continue the memory of a tyrant who persecuted Christians. So he basically wanted to cover up pieces of history and just thought he'd kind of, you know, adjust that calendar, you know, by 700 years. Um, it has been suggested that he arranged the numbers so that the leap years would be exact exactly divisible by four and that his new table would begin one Victorian cycle, i.e. 532 years, after his new epoch. Epoch? E-P-O-C-H. I never know how to say that. Epoch or epoch? The Anno Domini era became dominant in Western Europe only after it was used by the Venerable Bede to date the events in his History of the English People, completed in 731. Okay, here's just a little bit more. Evidence exists that his desire to replace these years with a calendar based on the incarnation of Christ was to prevent people from believing the imminent end of the world. At the time, some believed that the second coming and the end of the world would occur 500 years after the birth of Jesus. The current Anno Mundi calendar commenced with the creation of the world based on information in the Greek um, the, in the Greek calendar. It was believed that based on the, uh, the Mundi calendar, Jesus was born in the year 5,500 or 5,500 years after the world was created with the year 6,000 of the Mundi calendar making the end of the world. So it was equated with the second coming of Christ and not the end of the world. This is why he changed it. So as you can see, I mean, I can... There's a lot here. I mean, somebody says it was judged. How do we say this? I mean, it's like, it, it just, you know, I'll put a little here, and a little here, and a little here. There, now it'll make everybody happy. All right, so he ignored the existing table used by Rome, which was prepared in 457 by Victorious of Aqua, Aquitani, Aquitani. 
This is where my husband, he just he knew how to say all these Latin words, complaining that it did not obey Alexandrian principles without actually acknowledging their existence. To be sure that his own table was correct, he simply extended a table prepared in Alexandria that had circulated in the West in Latin, but was never used in the West to determine the date of Easter. However, a variant of it was used in the Byzantine Empire in Greece. The Latin table was prepared by a subordinate of Bishop Cyril of Alexandria shortly before Cyril's death in 444. This goes on and on. These guys were just making this up. So let's fast forward to most of the British church accepted the tables after the Synod of Whitby in 664, which agreed that the old British method, the insular Laticus, 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 should be dropped in favor of the Roman one. Quite a few individual churches and monasteries refused to accept them because they knew they, they were crazy. Uh, but the last holdout finally accepting them during the early 10th century after the first Frankish adaptation of Beattie's The Reckoning of Time was published by 771. Okay, so it says here that Diancius ignored his predecessors who usually placed the nativity in the year we now label 2 BC. In his 1605 theses, the Polish historian Laurentius Soli Sosliga was the first to suggest that Christ was actually born around 4 BC. Listen, it's all made up. Okay, so then in 2012, the Pope comes out and says, the entire Christian calendar is based on a miscalculation, the Pope has declared, as he claims in a new book that Jesus was born several years earlier than commonly believed. The mistake was made by a 6th century monk known as Diancius, or in English, Dennis the Small. <laughs> the 85-year-old pontiff claims in the book Jesus of Nazareth, the infancy narratives published on Wednesday. He said, the Pope, this is the Pope prior to the one we have now, the calculation of the beginning of our calendar based on the birth of Jesus was made by Diancius, who made a mistake in his calculations. Now, he says several years. How about several hundred? Okay. The Pope writes in the book, which went on sale around the world with an initial print of a million copies. The actual date of Jesus' birth, he said, was several years before. Several hundred years before. <laughs> the assertion that the Christian calendar is based on a false premise is not new. Many historians believe that Christ was born sometime between 7 B.C. and 2 B.C. And don't forget, you know, uh, it was, uh, you know, it changed the calendar, which used to run on the cycles of the moon. And then when we went to the seven-day week as opposed to the moon cycles, that really screwed everything up. Okay, and that really, that severed our ties to the earth and earth cycles and to the stars. And, you know, that, that changing the calendar was really, really significant in who and what we are and in making our, our true connections. Um, but anyway, so uh, Dennis the Small, who was born in Eastern Europe, is credited with being the inventor of the modern calendar and the concept of the Anno Domini era. Wow. But exactly how Dennis the Small <laughs> calculated the year of Christ's birth is not clear. And the Pope's claim that he made a mistake is a view shared by many scholars. Okay. Moving on. All right. So then I, I was just looking up some things, and I thought, okay, let's say it's 2012, which what that would mean uh, in um, numerology is that this is a five-year. And a five-year is for freedom and change. Those with a life path of five, or if our country is with a five, is to seek freedom above all else. Adventurers having a restless nature and being on the go, constantly seeking change and variety in life. They have a free spirit and need to have a variety in their day. Now, that is a personal 
path. But you can always take that number and that energy and, and put it onto something like a country. That sounds like now to me. Now listen, you can massage anything into anything and make it work. So am I doing that a little bit? Maybe, you know, you know, do I want it to be true? No, I have no emotional, you know, connection to this, but it just doesn't make sense. I mean, 2012 never felt like anything to me when it happened, but this does, right? Okay. So then, um, then that would make next year a six and it's about family harmony healing number. It's where you heal, where say the country would heal. The numerology number six is the number of family, home, harmony, nurturing, and idealism. Its foundation is family and harmonious home. But more than that, it strives for a harmonious family relationship. Well, that would mean a harmonious relationship throughout the world between our country and ours. We, you know, we are the... We are just, um, you know, the the molecule, you know, uh, you know, us humans of what's going on in in the solar system, right? So this would be true, you know, true for us as individuals, true for our country, true for the world, you know, just true. <laughs> um, so then I, uh, so then I, uh, I did a little bit of research, um, and I did it, um, in regards to what's going on as far as this conjunction in, on December 21st. And the only other time that this happened is where those, these plants were as close together as they are, because we've had other conjunctions, which is a Jupiter-Saturn, right? Um, there's only two other times that this, this has happened. And once in uh, 1236, and when Christ was born. And, you know, because these planets... Uh, are conjunct and so closely conjunct, it creates a very bright star. So, you know, hence the bright star of Bethlehem. What's really interesting, though, is that the last, this is from astronomers, and they said the last time it's believed to have been witnessed was in the year 12, 1226, according to Michael Shanahan, the director of the Liberty Science Center. He says, the interesting thing about these long cycles in astronomy is that they come back at very different, um, there's the word again, epochs, epochs of human history. He said, the event that happened in the Middle Ages in 1226 occurred before dawn. So there was about an hour and a half before the sun rose to see it. The last time astronomers believe it was possibly visible was in 1623, but it occurred right at sunset. And he said, there's no record of anyone having noticed it because the two planets were lost in the light of the setting sun. But he said, also, the planets formed the Christmas star or star of Bethlehem that the three wise men in the nativity story in the Bible were thought to have seen that inspired them to ultimately travel to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus. One possibility is that these two planets did join together in 7 B.C., Again, we're back to this 2012 thing. About a year before the earliest possible time of the birth of Jesus, so that it could have been a conjunction of the two planets. So again, it's like there's so much misinformation, but but it's significant because there was this conjunction when Christ was born, right? So, so he said... If they saw in 7 BC and said, oh, there's a big event happening, let's go to Bethlehem and check it out. But he said that, you know, this conjunction, Jupiter-Saturn, occurs every 20 years, but normally they are no closer than the width of two full moons. On December 21st, they will appear much closer. So that will create that brightness, okay? Okay, so listen, I'm just kind of 
thinking out loud, this is on the fly, as I do, because I'm so pressed for time, but I really wanted to share this and talk about this. So I went and I looked up, you know, things that happened in, in uh, 1226, and really, there's not, I mean, I can read you all kinds of stuff, but that was a time when there was nothing but upheaval every year, right? I mean, was that the beginning of the Dark Ages? I don't know. It's quite about a wide birth of what the what the Dark Ages were. But, you know, I, I printed out some of the things that had gone on. But honestly, nothing really sticks out. I guess unless you were someone that was involved in these different events. But Roman councils begin their year in office. The Julian calendar takes effect for the first time. That's significant. The Roman Senate posthumously defies Julius Caesar. The Roman legions in Germania Superior refuse to swear loyalty to Galba. They rebel and proclaim Vitilius as emperor. Romulus, legendary first king of Rome, celebrates the first Roman triumph after his victory over the Canonenses following the rape of the Sabine women, uh, uh, Publius Valerius Publicola, Roman council celebrates the first triumph of the Roman Republic after his victory over the deposed King Lucius at the Battle of Silva Arcia. Lu uh, Lucius Sulia, the head of a Roman Republic army, enters Athens, removing the tyrant Aristion, who, Aristion, who was supported by troops of I mean, it just goes on and on. I mean, it's just constant political upheavals. But that that was, you know, that was the flavor of, of, of the time. I mean, that was going on year after year after year. So nothing was at actually sticking out for me to find that was significant, though I do believe that this one on December 21st is very significant. I really do. What does that song mean? I don't know. Um... Does it mean that we're going to be ushering in the light? Feels that way to me. Uh, and and two things can happen. Um, you can get someone that has really been on the wrong path. I'm really trying to pull away from name calling and categorizing people because the more that I create distance, the more I can see how everybody's just been playing their part. No matter how evil we think they are, I'm not saying I excuse them, but I'm just saying that uh, they're playing their part. And so, you know, do we obtain enlightenment faster because things get darker and we, we say, oh my gosh, we better get busy here or does it mean that uh, this light that we're all experiencing just continues to be exponential? That's really where I'm leaning. Um, you know, is, that's a more comfortable place to lean. But gosh, that's just how it feels to me. Maybe that's personal, um, but that is just how it feels to me. <sighs> so maybe it's really, uh, you know, uh, 2012. And there's a lot of stuff going on, but you knew that. <laughs> okay. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. So, you know, just, uh, it was fun to research and, you know, uh, you know, just, I mean, just put, kind of putting my little toe in there and, and seeing, wow, you know, there might really be something to us. So I think, you know, let's consider it. Why not? Right. Okay. All right. So. Uh, love, life, harmony, peace, perfection, radical gardener, from my garden to yours, may your garden always grow. You know I'm sending you a ton of love. Okay, everybody? Goodbye.